I think we're going to be horrified in the next 10 years when we realize all these compounds that we're eating that aren't really food that are being sold to us as if they're completely, you know, acceptable things to eat. Um, when it turns out that they massively shift our microbiome and change our immunity and change the way we think and, you know, everything that they that they potentially do to us that, you know, we have not evolved with these non-food foods. So the body is not used to them and it's um, not surprising that it reacts badly. Collective Insights is a voyage through topics and technologies revolutionizing human well-being. Groundbreaking approaches for a better world and a better life await you. Welcome to Collective Insights. Hi, I'm Dr. Gregory Kelly. Before we get into this week's episode, I'm excited to share some information on a new product I helped formulate called Qualia Symbiotic. As a naturopathic physician, one of the most common concerns among my patients has always been gut and digestive health. In fact, recent survey data indicates approximately 40% of Americans experience digestive health discomfort on at least a monthly basis. But digestion is just one part of gut health. Did you know your gut also contains millions of neurons? It forms a two-way communication pathway with your brain called the gut-brain axis that affects your mood and brain performance. Your gut health is also crucial to immune health, optimal nutrient absorption, and even your aging process. In creating Qualia Symbiotic, I worked with the Neurohacker Science team to factor in a far broader range of considerations than just digestion alone to create an all-in-one formula supporting the full picture of gut health. The 28 gut health superfoods and ingredients in Qualia Symbiotic includes four form probiotics, psychobiotics that are ideal for supporting healthy brain performance, along with prebiotics, postbiotics, and fermented foods. And unlike many gut health products, Qualia Symbiotic is shelf stable with no refrigeration needed. It's also non GMO, vegan, gluten free, and FODMAP friendly. Add one scoop a day and a glass of water for comprehensive gut health support without the hassle and effort of a complicated gut health regimen. Go to neurohacker.com slash insights15 to try Qualia Symbiotic risk-free for 100 days and experience the difference that total gut health support can make. That's Qualia Symbiotic at neurohacker.com slash insights15 to start supporting the full picture of gut health. Hello, this is Dr. Greg Kelly the Director of Product Development at Neurohacker Collective and today's host for Collective Insights Podcast. And with us today, we have Alana Collin, a science writer with a PhD in evolutionary biology from University College London and the author of the life-changing popular science book, 10% Human, How Your Body's Microbes Hold the Key to Health and Happiness. She's a well-traveled zoologist, an expert in bad echolocation, and an accidental collector of tropical diseases. Welcome to the show today, Alana. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I loved your book. I, um, it's, you know, I've read a f- several books now um, related to health, the gut microbiome, and yours was a five star. That makes me happy. Sure. Um, so I wanted to just jump right in and just start with your background, because the, the beginning of your book, you talk a little bit of your own story and you know how you view things as an evolutionary biologist. So can you tell us a little bit about what led you to that profession and what an evolutionary biologist does? Uh, yeah, so um, it started, I mean, I've always kind of been a biologist since I was in my teens. That was my thing. Um, and I was very much into wildlife. I also loved human biology, but I loved wildlife. So um, I started studying bats when I was at university. And I then did a master's in bats and then a PhD in bats and many other trips Um for field work for other professors and so on and um, my PhD was in the evolution of bats so an evolutionary biologist is someone who studies how um, evolutionary changes take place over time so I was trying to work out how um, bats evolved echolocation the the way that they see the world um, through echoes through sound and um, so looking back to 85 million years ago what what call were they using um, and basically all this work took me to a lot of jungles and a lot of other very amazing habitat. Um, and that's where my kind of uh, journey into this microbiome thing began. I can imagine. Well, the I would think your background would give you a keen insight into 
the microbiota, microbiomes, because they're adapting all the time mm -hmm, and at absolutely. a really quick rate. Yeah, so it's it's one of the easy ways to see what's going on in evolution because it's, you know, for us it's really slow because our generations are sort of 25, 30 years each. But when your generation time is 20 minutes, like a bacterium, and you're doubling your population all the time, then it's very easy for scientists to work out how um, evolution takes place. So yeah, they are like a, a, a you know, a literal petri dish of, of studying evolution. One of the things, and this was right at the beginning of your book, when you tell a little bit about your time at, I know I'm probably mispronouncing it, but Crow Wildlife Reserve in Malaysia, Correct. and having gotten infected with a tropical disease, taking antibiotics, and this is from your book, um, I had a suspicion that antibiotics I had taken had not only eradicated the bacteria that plagued me, but also those that belonged in me. And I think that's such a profound realization for um, most people, right? That these things that we've of often been thought of as they're the, the villains, the bad guys in the story are actually doing these super important jobs. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, at that time, I had no idea that, um, you know, I knew that we had good microbes or, you know, good bacteria living in our guts, but I really was not aware of uh, how much they did for us. In fact, really no one was aware of how much they did for us. Um, but it just struck me that I, I think there's something to do with being an evolutionary biologist. It struck me that if they were living there, they probably had a role to play. And that if I'd taken so many antibiotics, then maybe I had damaged them. And that was why I was feeling ill in new ways from what I had before. But I know I was shocked with some of the statistics you put in your book about antibiotic use and how many courses, you know, an, an average adult would have or by you know, a certain age, how many a child would have. And I was thinking like, wow, I'm abnormal. I haven't had antibiotics, I think since 1987. But Wow, good not, for you. Wow, that's a really long time. I'm not anti-antibiotics. I just haven't had mm -hmm. a need. But it, it it was really, I think you know, there was maybe like 70 was an average adult's number yeah. of courses in a lifetime. And um, can you tell the audience a little bit about what happens, not just with one course, but when there's repeated courses of antibiotics over time? Yeah, so even one course can have a, a really significant effect in the short term um, because, I mean, it depends on the antibiotic, but very many antibiotics that we're given are what's called broad spectrum, and that's that they can kill a huge number of different different kinds of bacteria in one go. And that's super useful if you're a doctor and you're trying to wipe out an infection because you don't need to figure out what it is first. You just give someone this you know, cluster bomb. And it, it sorts it out. But the downside of that is the collateral damage it does to all of your microbes that you do actually need. So yeah, in the short time term, they're really very significantly affected. And um, if you're lucky within sort of two weeks, you get a significant rebound effect and a lot come back. Um, probably particularly if you have an appendix, which is like a little safe house for your microbes, um, where the antibiotics don't get in there quite as much as they do the rest of the gut. But um, over time, you will wear down the diversity of your microbiome by taking multiple courses of antibiotics. And on the flip side, you will also um, you will also increase your very own antibiotic resistance, um, which makes you less um, capable of, of, respond, of responding to antibiotics in the future. Um, but the most significant thing about taking antibiotics is when you do so or when your child does so, you know, when it when it's affecting um, particularly under three years old, um, it has a real impact. And even, you know, later in childhood, because at that stage, your microbes are communicating with your body to an incredible degree and they're teaching it how to be human. And so if you wipe those out or you even disturb them for a short period of time, you can have quite a big impact on on how we develop and, and how our immune systems function. Well, since you mentioned that early childhood period, kind of the critical window for our, both their you know brain development, but their gut microbiome, I loved how in the book you talked a little bit about, you know, the ecosystem idea, right? And described how, in a like a child, it's almost these sweeping changes one after another over those first few years. So mm -hmm. can you maybe share a little bit about what those are? Because I know most people think of lactobacillus because it's in yogurt as an example. And you mentioned that, but that only sweeps in quickly and then gets swept out to an right. extent. So. Yeah. So, you, so typically most babies or babies who are born vaginally will be inoculated with loads of lactobacillus. Um, 
because they are the vaginal microbiome and that's what the child is encountering when it comes into the world. And um, lactobacillus is super helpful because they break down lactose and lactose is the major sugar in breast milk. Um, so that's what you want them to be doing. Um, but as time goes on, they get replaced like in waves, just in the same way that you would, you know, if you left a patch of earth bare or a patch, of, even a patch of rock bare, you know, you'll start with getting some mosses and then some bigger plants will come in and then the soil level will build up. And ultimately, you know, if you left a big enough area, you would get some kind of forest, what we call a climax community. And that's effectively what's happening in your gut. It starts out kind of raw, like a patch of of rock and then it gets uh, a nice coating of um, microbes to start it off when you're born and then they get um, replaced by different sets of microbes until you have your climax community your adult microbiome um, somewhere between the age of three and 18 you know and, and it you know it can change throughout your life but there's something about the age of three which seems to be um, significantly more stable than the kind of infant microbiome Yes, somewhere, I don't remember which author, or maybe it was Ed Young, but it, like the thousand days is what sticks in my head yeah, as like right. a general heuristic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then one of the, the, a big part of what your book then does is it's, I think you say like, you know, you know, I've learned to ask the questions why, when, where, um, how, right? So you're trying to then sort out all these different modern diseases, you know, what we could think of as things that have really you know, become epidemics over the last four or five decades, of, you know, obesity, metabolic health, um, you know, neurodevelopment disorders. And I think I, I've, you know, had my eye on the, the weight obesity area for what feels like 20 years or more, actually more going back to the Navy when I was asked to help the overweight people get in shape. Um, and I just thought you did a fabulous job um, bringing all the different research together on the gut microbiome and obesity. So I'd love if you'd share a little bit of that with the audience. Yeah, so um, it's 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 more com complex than you would think it would be, is the first thing to say. So the, the thing that people first think is, oh, your microbes are consuming your food and therefore, you know, they can extract more calories from it and therefore you get fat because you've got calories. Um, but it's, it's more than that because of course, your body actually should have a mechanism to decide how much weight you carry, how much um, stored energy, energy stored as fat that you have. So if your microbes are taking in more calories for you, then your body sh still should balance how much it is carrying. So um, yes, if you have a microbiome, you can take in more calories than if you don't, like a really significant amount actually, maybe 30% um, additional calories. From I'm talking about mice here, so you can you can make mice germ-free where they're born in a sterile envir environment and they have no no microbes at all. And if you then add microbes, then they have to eat 30% more to stay the same weight. Um, so in in humans, that is part of it, but then the much more significant part is what they're doing to your immune system. So um, there's a couple of things. One is that your microbes, when they consume fiber in particular, they produce um, little chemicals, metabolites, which then stimulate um, your nervous system through the vagus nerve, which I think people are becoming much more aware of these days. Um, so the vagus nerve travels, actually collects information from all over your body, but very much from your gut. And it takes that information back to your brain to let the brain know what's happening in the body. And um, it is stimulated by the, the compounds that these that your microbes make when they eat, when they consume fiber. And that tells your brain um, that you're not hungry anymore. It's even more complicated than that, however, because the other thing that microbes do um, is they control your immune system and they stop your body from being inflamed. So there's an example in my book of one quite exciting microbe called Acomantia mucinophila, um, which means mucus loving mu mucinophila. And um, this microbe, it lives in the mucus, mucus layer on the edge of your gut and it eats fiber. And when it eats fiber, it then stimulates um, a particular kind of cell called a goblet cell in the lining of your gut to make more mu mucus. 
So it's providing itself with a home and it's providing itself also actually with something to eat. It much it prefers to eat the mucus. So when the other microbes are producing um, compounds from fiber, then that enables this, this mucus loving microbe to produce, to stimulate the gut to produce mucus for it to eat. And that mucus provides a barrier between your gut and your blood. Essentially, your gut is outside. It's like your skin. It's it's inside, but it's outside. It's exposed to the rest of the world. And so it has to have some pretty tight security policies to work out what should get through and what shouldn't. And obviously we want food to go through, but we don't want um, pathogenic microbes that could harm us. We don't want things like pollen to get into the bloodstream. You know, all sorts of things that aren't helpful to us if they go across the bloodstream. Uh, so we have this mucus layer and we also have a set of cells that um, are really clever chemically and they can work out whether they should let something through or not. And they're a bit like bricks. So they can, bricks that can move, they can they can move apart and allow things through or they can tighten up and stop things from coming through. So when you're, um, when you have a good microbiome and you're eating fiber, those things stimulate a nice um, mucus layer and they make your gut lining stick together really nicely and tightly. And that prevents things that shouldn't be going into the bloodstream from going into the bloodstream. If you have a poor microbiome, you have a thin mucus layer, um, your gut lining isn't being told that it needs to tighten those defenses, then all sorts can get through, um, including compounds that the gut microbiome itself makes, which are um, inflammatory. And it is that inflammation that, that that process then creates in your body where the immune system goes, oh my God, what is this stuff? I don't want any of this in my in my blood. Um, and it has a little panic, it sets the immune system on high alert. And that then changes um, your brain and changes your uh, the regulation of your appetite, the regulation of how much weight your body wants to carry and um, enables you, in, you know, makes your body want to carry more weight and makes you want to eat more, makes you um, be more restful and want to exercise less. So there's an awful lot more control that is nothing to do with consciousness, nothing to do with greed, laziness, you know, someone's personality. Um, it's just about what's happening biologically in your gut and in your brain that um, determines how much weight you're carrying. And the, um, I want to just touch on acromancia for a second. So that's a favorite of, uh, you know, I, I know the biohacker community in general here in the States. Mm -hmm. And um, I know when I described it to our marketing team and some of the people at Neurohacker, it's like, oh, think of this, this is a next generation bacteria that's also thought of as a keystone species. So, mm -hmm. You know, having more of it in its niche, it just controls that niche, reshaping it to make that that whole gut healthier. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you also mentioned um, fecal bacterium as another, you know, um, important one of the organisms in your book as well, which is another of the, mm -hmm. you know, the keystone species. And so, um, I think, like what I've seen is like the. Most of us think of probiotics as the old generation, or mm -hmm. I think of it as, you know, 1.0 probiotics, mm -hmm. the lactobacillus, um, bifidobacteria, which is nothing wrong with those. But when I hear or I see things written about acromancy, it's like, oh, cool, they're talking about the next generation, like the updating. Yeah. Absolutely. And it really is the next generation because the, the tricky, th one of the reasons why the, the traditional probiotics that we have are, are the probiotics that we have are that they're easy to grow in an oxygenated environment. So we use them for, um, you know, we can use, we can do stuff outside the body. We can make yogurt from lactobacillus and, um, yeah, they're easy to make. The trouble with Akamansia is it's not, you know, you'll, you'll see, uh, I've seen online Google searches, like suggested searches, where can I buy Akamansia? You, you can't, I'm afraid, because, um, it's anaerobic, which means it exists solely um, in environments with no oxygen. And so it's not actually that easy to make into um, a probiotic that you can just sell on the shelf. Um, it is, though, being worked on in that way. I'm not sure where they're up to, but they're, they're, there were various patents when I was writing the book um, that even making compounds kind of metabolites from the acomancia, even dead acomancia seems, um, seems to work to some degree. Um, 
And so I'm sure one day it will be a commercially available um, probiotic. It's not the be all and end all. It's not like you've got that, you're thin, you don't have it, you're overweight. It's not nearly that simple. And there are so many that, that potential bacteria and interactions as well that can play into it. And of course, there's what you do with your microbes. It's not just like take some and then you're sorted. You've got to feed them. And, you know, there's also a lot of, I mean, I'm actually writing my next book on um, obesity and on the uh, the underlying causes of obesity. So not diet and exercise, but what makes us eat too much? What makes us move too little? Why does that happen? What's happening in, in our guts? What's happening in our brains um, for that to happen? And, you know, I'm not talking about psychology here. I'm talking about like the, the real nitty gritty biology of it. Um, and yeah, and there are many, many things that play into it. But yeah, Akamansu is a beautiful example. Well, in, in the States, there is a company, um, they have, Pendulum would be the product that makes okay. an Akamansia that's um, live, like a live probiotic. And I think um, EFSA in Europe has only improved, you mentioned like the inactivated, so the like a postbiotic version yeah. of Akamansia, but I'm not sure if there's a company selling that in Europe. And then just, you know, my role, you know, I get spoken to a lot by probiotic companies and companies selling into the dietary supplement space. And there's at least two I know of that oh, are really? on, on oh, state saying Akramansia. So okay. I think it'll become much more um, available. But like you mentioned, it's a piece of the puzzle, but this is a crazy complicated puzzle. It is. It really is. The 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 complexity, it's a, an absolute web of you know, we're not just talking about the microbes themselves and how they interact with it, each other, but how they interact with our genes and how they interact with our food. And just there are so many variables here that it is really difficult to pull it all apart. And there are, of course, many, many pieces that are acting simultaneously as well. Well, did you mention genes? So let's touch on genes, because one of the cool things that you highlight in your book is that our genes are, are fixed, at least, you know, what we got for genes, the expression of those is modifiable. But tell us a little bit of, about the microbe, the microbe genes and how they're like that um, is a different kind of tool or something that resource we could tap into. Yeah, so we have about 23,000 genes as humans. And um, like you say, like the genes themselves are kind of fixed. You, you know, they're not going to change over your lifetime. That's what, that's what you got. Um, the expression of those genes, you can change to some degree. And there is... Um, and, and it varies from generation to generation, which isn't the same as evolution. There's a, like the expression of them is called epigenetics. And, um, but there's, you know, there are limits to what you can do. Uh, whereas your microbiome, it's got far more gene than, than, um, your own genome. So there's an awful lot to play with there. And you do have some control over it, not complete control. Um, and your control, you know, it takes time to make significant changes and to, and to make them last. Um, we, we don't really understand a whole lot about what is coming from your body to control your microbiome. We do understand more about what's coming externally that controls your microbiome, i.e. diet, antibiotics, breast milk, that kind of thing. But we don't really know how your body determines what, what microbes you can or can't carry. Um, but yeah, you've got you've got freedom to at least try and meddle with your microbiome and try and improve your health via that and through what you eat and through the medications you take, um, which is, again, much more complicated than just antibiotics. Um, other medications affect your microbiome like antidepressants and all sorts. Um, and yeah, and then if you're planning to be a parent in particular, you have a unique opportunity to do the best um, for your child's microbiome. Um, it's a tricky one because, of course, people don't always have the choice for various different reasons. But um, babies who are born um, naturally, uh, vaginally, rather than by C-section, get a more um, healthy microbiome than those who come out by C-section because they get skin and hospital microbes typically instead of uh, vaginal and fecal microbes. And then breastfeeding is um, extraordinary in the way it develops the microbiome because it's, you know, they've evolved, it's evolved to to do it perfectly. And, and I, yeah, again, I'm not like, I'm not down on formula or C-sections. They're like life-saving, just as I'm not down on antibiotics, they're life-saving things that we need. But um, where you have a choice, when you have a choice, it's great to be able to do things the natural way. 
um, because it makes such a difference to how your microbiome, your child's microbiome evolves. I think the, uh, I've heard the, some scientists use the word extinct. You, you, again, you mentioned in your book, the differences between some hunter gatherer or more um, you know, people living a more natural environment and the diversity of their gut microbiomes versus, you know, there was a study where they looked at the Italian children. Um, you know, I've seen a few things like that. And, um, you know, I think the key thing is once the species goes extinct, it's, you know, your ecosystem's just not going to be designed or adapted to, you know, allow it to thrive, even if you did try to reintroduce it. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really tricky. And another thing that we, that, you know, I'm sure there'll be a lot more research on in the future, but that's, that's it. If you take antibiotics again and again, you're going to kill off some of your species. And how are you going to get them back? Maybe you will. Maybe you'll encounter it again on some food or from kissing someone or from, you know, from, you know, even nasty sources like sharing toilets, you might get those microbes back. But um, but you can't guarantee it. And it's it's pretty hard work for your microbiome to to recover that kind of diversity after it's been lost. It's, it's like, you know, chopping down a rainforest and then wanting it to be a rainforest again is going to take a lot of time and a, a lot of chance and probably some intentional reintroductions to make that happen. So, yeah as much as you can avoid damaging it in the first place, that's great. You've mentioned a few of the things in the modern world that impact the, you know, the stability, diversity, evolution of a, an individual's microbiome. So you touched on, you know, the antibiotics, you know, about what we eat. Um, you mentioned just in passing that, you know, other drugs as well. Is there other things in the modern world that have a profound effect on our gut microbiomes? <laughs> Those are certainly by far the biggest players. Like your diet is is just completely fundamental and you can change your microbiome within two or three days by changing your diet. But it will go back again if you change your diet back again. Um, so that's that's not ideal. Um, there is also probably some role for exercise in, in what your microbiome looks like. Um, the studies on exercise have been a bit they're not easy to interpret because often people have studied athletes mm. and, you know, say saying that someone who does a lot of exercises has a different microbiome from someone who doesn't when they're an athlete. And there may be so many other things that they do, you know, a special diet, all sorts. It's, it's not really clear. Um, but you know, we know exercise, the role of exercise in, in longevity and health is huge. So, um, and in, in reducing inflammation, so um, once again, like going back to the obesity thing, exercise doesn't seem to help people lose weight. There's really very poor evidence that it makes a significant dent in people's weight. Um, even though it burns calories, it just means your body balances it out, makes you eat more, makes you save more if you can't eat more. Um, but um, it reduces inflammation and that's more fundamental than, than reducing calories because it's, it's making your body healthier from the root rather than just trying to cut out a few calories. So that's a big one. Um, and then, yeah, there's, I think there's likely to be so many medications that play a really significant role that we just don't, we haven't even touched on what, what they do to the microbiome. And I'm sure we'll discover some horrifying things and maybe even more discover some good things about what they do. But my intuition is almost anything that we would put in our mouth and swallow is going to have some impact. You know, mm -hmm. maybe less or maybe more. I know even a lot of vitamins or it's like there's different forms of B3 sold in the U.S. And you know, at least in animal studies, they all have slightly different effects on the gut microbiome in animal mm -hmm. studies. Mm -hmm. Because like as an example, you know, the fleshing nice and versus the non-fleshing versus something like nicotinamide riboside, which is a bigger molecule, which mm -hmm. now means things that can cleave and eat that part of the molecule. Mm -hmm. get to get, uh, you know have some food so it's like you said it's a really complicated yeah uh, another another one thinking of, of vitamins and so on is um ultra processed foods the compounds that we're eating that are not even food and we eat a shocking amount of it i think about 50 percent of the british and american diet is ultra processed food and you know something so simple as um as sweeteners you know, non-sugar sweeteners, they change your microbiome. 
And, you know, there's increasing evidence that they are not good for you. And they, there's also very poor evidence that they help you lose weight. Um, in fact, they may even do the opposite. So they seem to help you lose weight in for a couple of week, weeks, which might be related to water weight um, because sugars help you like store a little bit of water. But um, over the long term, they seem to change your microbiome and increase inflammation, which leads to your body wanting to store more weight and store more energy as fat again. So yeah, they those I just I think we're going to be horrified in the next 10 years when we realize all these compounds that we're eating that aren't really food that are being sold to us as if they're completely, you know, acceptable things to eat. Um, when it turns out that they massively shift our microbiome and change our immunity and change the way we think and, you know, everything that they that they potentially do to us that, you know, we have not evolved with these non-food foods. So the body is not used to them and it's, um, not surprising that it reacts badly. Well, since you're talking about what you eat, both foods and the non-food things in food, um, one of my favorite quotes in your book was, you are what you eat. What's more, you are what they eat. Mm -hmm. With each meal, you make spirit thought for your microbes. What would they like you to put in your mouth today? So I know, like, honestly, I keep that in mind now when I eat. So... Yeah, me too. I yeah, I I do think that a lot and you know, I'm not I'm not like I'm no angel when it comes to um my diet. I could definitely still make improvements, but I do definitely think about my microbes. I just I can't help it and and it's it is an incentive, I think, to to think about what you're eating and to um I I really like fermented foods these days and um I probably wouldn't have even bothered trying had I not known about um about the microbiome, so yeah. Can you tell us a few of the fermented foods that are favorites? Um, kimchi, 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 <laughs> and, and kefir as well. I love kefir, and and I like. I get, I buy it. I'm not. I don't have enough time to make it. Sadly, um, my mum makes it every single day. But yeah, I buy it, and I and I add different fruits to it. I love adding rhubarb. Um, you know, it's like that's. I'm. I don't subscribe to the whole superfood thing, but. If I was going to say one thing, rhubarb, it's amazing. And it, you know, it's, it's got really unique fibers. It tastes delicious. And yeah, so I add that to kefir quite a lot. And then kimchi, like for me, like it's some kind of toast with melted cheese on top and kimchi on top of that. That's just, that's just perfection. Um, I, you know, I also eat some of the other ones, but not nearly so regularly as that. I mean, I eat yogurt all the time as well. I eat yogurt daily. But yeah, kimchi. <laughs> You're the second person in the last week that's raved about kimchi to me. <laughs> well, do you know what? I, I honestly think it's addictive. And I, I talked to this about this with um, with friends who are fermenters. And, and it makes an awful lot of sense. And I think I even spoke, I wrote about this in the book as well, that um, your microbes have some control over your brain. They have some control over what you eat and what you feel like eating. So I think if you eat kefir or kimchi, then you're contributing to a different shape microbiome. And then some elements of that microbiome are are sending messages saying more, please, because it's in their interest, right? If you've got a species that loves something within kimchi, then in order for that species to, to grow, it needs more of that food stuff that's sustaining it. So if it can tell you that you want more, so much the better. I think the example I gave in my book is of um, seasonality and memory related to where particular uh, fruit trees might be, for example, for um, let's, let's say a, a nomadic tribe who are moving around um, following their food sources throughout the seasons. If their microbes can help them to form a, um, like a spatial memory of what they've had where then they can the microbes can get more of that thing so if they if they you go to a fruit tree you eat that fruit it increases the population of a particular strain of microbes that strain of microbes then sends messages to your brain saying well, remember this place then they'll you'll come back the following year and it will get another boost um so you know that kind of thing is remarkable and you you see it uh, in various studies, things to do with autism, for example, about how people remember and how they forget. And um, 
conditions where you over remember things and you can't let go of what you've remembered so there's no space for new things and that can all be microbe influenced as well yeah i love that in the book when you pointed out the importance of forgetting or oh. like and it was mouse models of autism and that you know that what it seems like the their microbiota are doing is they're preventing them from forgetting which then creates some of the patterns of behavior you would see in both those mice but then in that model, would it be expected in humans? Mm -hmm. well? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's it's all about um, pruning synapses in your brain. Um, these connections that enable you to form a memory. I think I spoke about the um, there's a some American twins who are autistic savant twins, and they have an incredible memory for uh, something like record, like what song was or what was on TV or what song was released on a particular day. They also remember what they ate on that day, interestingly, given the connection with microbes. And they remember the weather on that day. Um, but they can't they can't remember new things. They can't remember how to dress themselves and so on. But um those those traits have been reinforced again and again. Uh, and the you know, the microbiome in autistic people seems to be different from it is in neurotypical people. So again, we've got this idea that, you know, their their synapses have reinforce these same memory roots again and again and again whereas in someone who's neurotypical there's you know you don't need to know what the weather was in 1999 because what does it do for you now and um, so you know that's an important thing that the brain needs to be able to do is forget the stuff that's not going to help you to survive in the future and remember the stuff that is and so these synapses are either reinforced because it helps you or they're pruned because it's pointless. Um, and yeah, microbes are involved in that. I think of my memory, I've always thought of my memory as not gifted, like not that type of memory, but solid, right? It does a good mm -hmm. job for me, but I always thought like, oh, more would be better, right? Like who would want even better memory? And it has to be at least 20, 25 years ago. And I don't remember the book, but in it, they were talking about this one case of, I believe it was a, a gentleman that was thought of as having one of the best memories on record. So they studied him quite a bit. And the thing I remember taking away from that book is like, oh, there's a cost to having this crazy good memory. There were certain mm -hmm. things I take for granted that I can do that he was in, unable to do because he couldn't forget. Mm -hmm. as he's only. Yeah, we, we actually need adaptability. We need to be able to alter things as as the you know, as our environment changes so you know it'd be fabulous to have an amazing memory and it not affect your ability to process other th other things but i don't know maybe there's an analogy with a computer that's got a really full hard drive and it and it can't work as quickly as it should be able to because it's got no space it's got no working um capacity left because its memory is so full and in biology, there are always trade-offs. That's what evolution is all about. You can't have everything. You can't, you know, simultaneously, you can't have eyes in the back of your head and in the front because there's not enough energy to make that justifiable. Well, one thing I do want to get back to, because you're not the first person that's brought it up, was that idea of, you know, maybe our microbiota because of, you know, us feeding something that's helped one species or many species, you know, thrive, are nudging us towards, oh, more. I want more of this. So I, you're of the three different people I've spoken to that have spent a lot of time in the gut microbiome space. They all believe that to be true. Right? The, the research is preliminary, but they all think of it yeah, same thing. Yeah. And I know I take, um, we call it quality symbiotic. It's one of our products, but it's prebiotics some fermented foods and probiotics. And I'm, I, at the beginning was very regimented. I took it first thing every day for two months and then decide, oh, I'll just take it whenever. And there's days because it's whenever I'll forget. And all of a sudden at 8.30 at night, it's like, take this. Like it just, you know, I'll be watching Netflix or something and it's just, go oh, flashes into my mind. Like, you haven't taken this yet. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> that's them done. You know, your microbes are giving you a little hint. Yeah. I Well, I find that with kefir. That if, I, if I drink it daily, then... I really look forward to drinking it. If for some reason I don't have it, if I go away for a few days, the first three days or so, I'll be thinking about kefir a lot. And then if I stay away for longer, then I'll I'll steadily stop thinking about kefir. But then as soon as I start drinking it again, I start I I become kind of obsessed again, <laughs> and I just I just really want it. So yeah, I, I'm I'm sure that that there is a communication there that's um, 
reinforcing what we eat. I, I think the same to some degree is true of things like sugar that initially if you try to cut down on your sugar intake it's really hard and your body screams for it and then after a while it you kind of get used to it and and then you know you're just not craving anymore which again could be my, the microbes telling you what you know is what populations are there if that population that's craving sugar has died away then you haven't got those same messages coming to you to to remind you that you want sugar yeah i always think of um that's sustaining something for a bit. I, I know for me with movement, I, I used to do a lot of bicycle riding, but anything with movement, it seems like for my body, if I do it routinely for a while, then all of a sudden I'll get an itch to do it if mm-hmm. I don't do it on a certain day. And I always think of that, oh, that's like, I finally got to, well, now it's more work not to do it than to yeah, keep doing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. So, well, um, since your book, because it's been a few years now, has there been anything new that's come out that's really either cemented what you wrote about, but were stretching maybe where the science was, or that's caused you like, oh, this is super cool? Um, well, I mean, I think the most amazing thing is how many things I left out of the book because I just felt like I can't say that microbes cause everything. <laughs> and and in fact, one of my earliest I, I remember getting a, a three-star review and I was horrified. You know, when your book first comes out, you're like, it, it's, it, you know, it affects you, all the reviews. And I read this three-star review and, and it said something like, she hammers at everything that looks like a nail and basically blames everything on microbes. And um, the thing that's really become noticeable in, in the in now eight years since I wrote it is how many more things I could have written about. So I left out cancer, basically. I left out um, dementia. I left out Parkinson's because all of them had, you know, the evidence was tenuous. There wasn't anything particularly big or bold that I could talk about. And I, at the time I thought, you know, they're all immune related. It's completely plausible that they are going to be, um, you know, significantly influenced by the microbiome. But that's what's really struck me over the last eight years, that there's just, there is um, a role for the microbiome in everything. And that's not because microbes cause everything, but rather because they are fundamental to everything, just like, you know, our genetics and our environment. They're just part of the web of what makes a a human body tick. So um, them being involved in everything doesn't mean that, you know, there's some crazy magical thing going on. It's just, it's inevitable that they're involved in everything. Um, so yeah, that's been that's been intriguing. Um, what else? I mean, I've seen I've seen a lot more backup for um, various different elements of um, of the story uh, in terms of neurodiversity and mental health. I think like I touched on depression and anxiety, um, and I touched on some more uh, kind of neuropsychiatric disorders that you wouldn't necessarily refer to as mental health. And those links have been considerably strengthened. You know, there's some really significant, I think the the idea that depression and anxiety are inflammation linked or have, you know, a significant part of them or a significant proportion of the people who suffer from them have um, uh, have inflammation as part of their basis. That's really, you know, well accepted now. Um, but the one other thing I'd say is that it's just extraordinary to go within 10 years from people saying microbiome, what's that? To it's everywhere. It's in adverts. It's, you know, it's, looking after your gut is completely accepted as both scientifically and by um, the population as a whole. I think the only people who haven't accepted it are doctors. <laughs> Controversial, sorry. But um, yeah, I've, I've, it's very much like in terms of uh, the impact it's had on our culture in such a short time. I think that's amazing. Well, I know um, recently, I would say in the last three or four years, I've seen just an explosion in the gut joint axis. If I look on, you know, mm. PubMed, right? Like for, you know, your arthritis type mm-hmm. thing. So, um, you know, gut skin axis now is fairly well established. So I, I think it's pretty safe to say like you started earlier, that it's inside of us, but outside of us. But it's mm-hmm. it's a part that connects to all the other parts. 
Yeah, it is. It's, it is almost like the interface, isn't it? It's between our genes and our environment. And, you know, the, as a as a biologist, uh, an evolutionary biologist in particular, you're constantly seeing this phrase, G times E, which means gene by environment interaction. That equals what something is, is the genes plus what the environment is. That's how a trait becomes. But the bit that's missing from that is the microbiome. That's how you get from environment to genes in so many cases. And that's how you create um, the the phenotype, the type, the, the trait, the physical trait that you see um, or that you experience is via the microbiome. And we touched a little bit about what you, you know, like fermented foods, but in your book, you mentioned fiber a lot and how, you know, like writing your book caused you to really go out of your way to drastically increase your yeah. fiber. Has that persisted? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I th- I think I probably made a big deal about my breakfast. I still make a big deal about breakfast because I just think it's your best opportunity in the day to get a whole host of nutrients and fiber that you um, that are harder to get in the rest of the day or less reliable. Most people eat pretty much the same thing for breakfast every day. So if you can have a, um, a high fiber breakfast with loads of different um, grain types, nuts, seeds, um, something fermented like yogurt or kefir, some dairy if you're if you're tolerant of dairy, um, and some fruit, especially if you can get in some highly colored fruits because the polyphenols in those um, interact with the microbiome and generally appear to keep us healthy. Then you know you're off to a really good start. You could you could probably eat if you're not a fiber lover lover already. You could probably eat the quantity of fiber that you're having in your entire day just at breakfast by working on your breakfast and then you know you've got a bit of freedom the rest of the day to um to not be so well behaved (laughs) i know um i think of you mentioned polyphenols and you know colorful fruits but i I always think of you know the fruit polyphenols as prebiotic like or prebiotics Mm -hmm. with a twist they they're not quite classified as prebiotics but there's certainly some of the microbiota that thrive when they get enough polyphenols in our diet right which is their diet yeah once again yeah it's it's the via the microbiome thing isn't it they're the ones who are encountering it first so yeah those things are like that's a eat the rainbow is what i have a seven-year-old daughter and i say is your tummy colorful today what did you have and we she says i had orange i had green you know and then i go okay so you need some yellow so have some sweet corn you know and that's yeah that's part of the part of my thinking about what they eat that's a wonderful i i I'm, i'll keep that <laughs> I hope, hopefully our audience like eat a rainbow <laughs> yeah and that's what, what i try to do with my breakfast i love having raspberries and blueberries because i'm like that's red and purple ticked off brilliant well we're just about um out of time so i wanted to get back to something you teased earlier which is you've been working on another book is there anything you can share with the listeners about when that might be available or too early to tell? Um, it's going to be published by Grand Central Publishing, uh, which is an imprint of Hachette. And um, yeah, I'm working on it now. So um, it's, and it, it, as I said before, it kind of goes into the underlying reasons of how your body manages the weight it carries. Um, so I see the diet and exercise is, is, is how you gain weight or lose weight and what I want to know is why you know what is happening underneath what's the what's the mechanism that makes your body want to gain weight or lose weight I I I personally think that the diet and exercise thing is completely secondary well I'm definitely going to be looking forward to reading it that's an area I am you know love learning more about and can't wait for your contribution so again um for anyone uh, Alana's first book, 10% Human, I highly recommend it. I gave it five stars and I don't, I'm not an easy grader. So. <laughs> yeah, that's very flattering. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us today on Collective Insights. Thank you for having me. It's been really fun. This podcast is for informational purposes only. The podcast is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. You should not use the information on the podcast for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease, or prescribing any medication or other treatment. 
Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider before taking any medication or nutritional, herbal, or homeopathic supplement, and with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this or any other podcast. Reliance on the podcast is solely at your own risk. Information provided on the podcast does not create a doctor-patient relationship between you and any of the health professionals affiliated with our podcast. Information and statements regarding dietary supplements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to therein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician. This podcast is owned by Neurohacker Collective.